between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series, where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders. We have Rob today. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, create additional revenue streams and stop just trading time for dollars. We hold you accountable to achieve your biggest goals with a step-by-step roadmap. Go to Rise25.com to learn more. It's run by myself, co-founder John Corcoran. And Rob knows a thing or two about small businesses. And Rob Frowine is co-founder of Cabbage. He co-founded it with the help of Catherine Petralia and Mark Gorlin, and the Cabbage platform has funded more than, I don't want to get this wrong, Rob, $2.7 billion in loans. Perfect. They provide an advanced lending online platform to help small businesses borrow the funds they need. They've raised $236 million in equity since their formation. They have 350 employees across five offices in the U.S. and international and a fun fact about Rob is when he was in college, one of his jobs was to draw blood, which he learned to do on comatose patients. Rob, thanks for joining me. Thanks. That last part comes out being, people are going to be like, what is he talking about there? <laughs> but So let me explain. I, so uh, I worked in a hospital in a variety of jobs uh, going through college. And um, one of my first job was I worked in a lab and I drew blood. Um, but of course, I had no prior experience in drawing blood like uh, most people, and other than vampires, I guess. Uh, and so uh, the way you learn uh, is they certainly show you first, uh, and then there are some patients who are more willing or less uh, objectionable. Um, it didn't happen a lot. It sounds terrible, but I want to say that I never missed a vein okay. um, of, a, of a comatose patient. So, uh, so there's that. That's good. Yes. I want to start off. There's, there's a lot of interesting things. You have a lot of insights in the small business world. Um, tell me about the significance of the bottle of champagne and $50 million. $50 million. Okay. Wow. There's that one. Um, so when we close our series I think a, this is one of my favorite parts of one of your talks. So if anyone has a really? chance to check out your talk, I thought this is a genius idea, not just for, you know, for what you're going to talk about but for business in general or, or staff or whoever it is yeah no yeah. and it's it, it's about um you know figuring out what your next milestone is and and giving somebody a um a way uh to really memorialize that and 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 shoot for it but when we closed our series a financing which was in december 2010 right before the holidays mark orlin who you mentioned is one of my co-founders had this brilliant idea he presented each of the folks in the company at that time and that time there was only seven of us uh, with a bottle of champagne, and the bottle of champagne um, was nice. So we were like, "Hey, thank you." And should we open it, or what should we do with it? And he said, uh, "No, no, you got to turn it and read it." And it said there was a label, and it said to be opened by, in my mind, said Rob for a line. Uh, when cabbage uh, reaches a value of, you know, and you mentioned the number fifty million dollars, which at that time was a was a large multiple of what we had closed our first round at. And the idea was that we would have hold this bottle on our desks. Uh, until we reached that milestone. And when we did, we would open up the bottle, share it with everybody that was in the company at that time, which would obviously be hopefully more than the number of people that we had at, at that present moment, more than seven, and then issue a new bottle um, to uh, everybody that was then there so that, that we could carry on that tradition. And by the way, whether it's $50 million or it's achieving some customer milestone or right. it's doing something doesn't else, it yeah. doesn't make a difference. It's just something that you can really objectively reach for. And so uh, we've now opened up three bottles of champagne. Everybody, you know, everybody that was in the company after we opened the last one received the fourth in the series. And I think our last champagne bill uh, was over $12,000, <laughs> really? um, which uh, uh, we would not have been able to afford with our first, uh, w when we first got that. Uh, but I think that went from, uh, two, you know, I don't know what, five, you know, seven bottles of, uh, and it's good champagne. It was v Vuv. Um, but... Um, 
But when we had well over 200 bottles to buy, it was a, it was a different story altogether. Yeah. I love that. that that's yeah, great. It was, it was, it was, it was phenomenal. And, and you see a lot of champagne. Uh, there's a theme in this office uh, and that's one of them. So, yeah, no, I love, thanks for sharing that. Um, yep. so how'd you come up with the name cabbage? So cabbage, um, so uh, I wish it was one of these great, like, really cool stories. But we, we spent um, uh, when and I'm talking about Catherine and Mark, and we had another guy I was good friends with, uh, this guy Nick Steele, and the four of us um, spent like multiple nights in a bar um, over a period of of a couple of weeks. That's where all uh, the good was, stuff happens. Yeah. yeah, which wasn't terribly unusual. And um, and so we were trying to come up with a name for the company, and we wanted something that connoted um, money. And so we went through every imaginable Ooh. like name you might come up with. And whenever we checked the domain name, it was always taken and, and you know, owned by some company that actually built something. Uh, so we were never going to be able to, to buy the domain. And then Nick, uh, who I mentioned a second ago, uh, we were going through the various food groups. We moved from like bread and vine and all these other things to the fruit and veggies area. Uh, and he came up with cabbage and cabbage. You may not, you may or may not know is a term, a slang term for money. So if you go to the, sort of the dictionary.com, you put in cabbage, you'll see the second or third entry is slang mm -hmm. for money from the early 1900s and cabbage with a C.com was $75,000 cabbage with a K.com was 1200 bucks. Okay. So we, uh, so we bought cabbage with a K and now when we look at cabbage spelled uh, the more traditional way, uh, it doesn't make like sense. No, yeah, it's it misspelled. Yeah. It's obviously a type. So you should all go into your dictionaries on your computers and laptops and add cabbage with a K to your dictionary. There you go. So it's never misspelled. What was the original idea? Was it exactly what it is now? No, actually, my original idea. So this is literally my idea. Um, I was um, thinking there was two things happening in my world at that time. Well, lots, probably more than two things. But in, in terms of this concept, two things. One is... Um, I had been working with a company that was utilizing data that was pulled from online sources to identify counterfeit and fraudulent products sold online. Mm. Like, is that Tiffany lamp being sold on eBay or Amazon really a Tiffany lamp? Mm. Um, and so um, I, you know, it was product. So it was information about the product and information about the seller. And so we would make a determination, sort of a green, yellow or red, whether that was likely um, counterfeit or stolen or not. And we did this on behalf of brands. And so it was my first exposure um, to leverage data that was on the internet for other than buying something um, or reading a uh, reading paper, uh, reading you know reading the news. Um, and so I had that experience. And at the same time, I was I don't know why I was doing this, but I was I wondered you know what would happen if a company like eBay bought a credit company. At that point, they hadn't bought Bill and Me Later when I came up with the idea. I said they would obviously fund the small businesses that are selling through their site. Same idea would would hold true for Amazon. Right. So my first inkling of the idea was actually, say you wanted to sell something and you needed the money today. And, and I was thinking about it from a complete pedestrian consumer perspective, like I've got that surfboard in the garage that I haven't used for 10 years that's collecting dust and it's probably worth 150 bucks, but I need 100 bucks for the weekend. How would I go about doing that? So the original idea was really helping people um, earn, you know, get money for the sale in advance of the sale. That was the first idea. Mm -hmm. uh, but it quickly evolved because you, we're not going to become a big company trying to fund the sale of surfboards, uh, old right. surfboards. So, um, so we sort of evolved the idea and it be, really became sort of a small business lender. Most importantly, that original idea was still intact, which was have the small business owner actually connect us to key data sources that related to how they run their business. And the theory went, if you could see how that small business was operating, how they were treating their customers, what their volume was, um, you know, sort of the diversity of their customer base, things along those lines, you could make a pretty compelling decision about, you know, how that business will handle um, credit uh, and repayment of that credit. And that was yeah. really that was really the fundamental concept. And so we we've obviously evolved quite a bit from that that juncture. Yeah. I mean, you have, you know, again, like you have very sophisticated probably technology and back end where you pull in a lot of sources. Um, what did the first version look like? Ah, well, if you go to the Wayback Machine online, you'll see it. Um, it was actually just we started uh, and I know we talked about, you know, you, you, in your intro, you mentioned the Amazon sellers. That was a that was a quick follow on. We started with eBay sellers and all you needed to do was put in your eBay ID. Mm. 
and we would actually be able to get to a decision by just looking at your eBay ID. Really? Now, after the fact, you would have to add a few other pieces of information, but we could actually make a decision on whether to loan you money literally just on your eBay ID. And oh. um, that was just accessing generally access, uh, accessible APIs that eBay provided. Um, and so it had uh, the, the artwork on it had this like beautiful green field, like farming field. It looked like you're out in the middle of the, you know, like I, I grew up in New Jersey and Pennsylvania area. And there's these beautiful rolling hills in Pennsylvania of, of farms. And that's what it kind of looked like. Um, so uh, so we went with that route first. Nice. Yeah. And so I want to talk about who is a perfect fit, like who's an ideal customer to use cabbage right now? It's a it's a great question. Um, number one, small business. Uh, so we're, you know, we, we basically help small business access capital. Um, so that's the most important thing. But, but one of our goals is actually not to, is not to have a situation where, you know, you necessarily are like, well, I'm a small business that kind of works for cabbage or I'm a small business that doesn't at our best, we should be able to serve the extremes of small businesses, larger, smaller, yeah. different industries, all those types of things. Um, I can tell you what our average customers, our average yeah. customers, um, you know, have been in business for, you know, between five and 10 years, um, have generated, you know, generate, you know, anywhere from 500 to a million, 500,000 to a million dollars. But I will tell you right now that we have customers that generate $25,000 a year in revenue. Yeah. And we have customers that generate $10 million a year in revenue and everything in between. At this point, we've served nearly 100,000 small businesses. And if we've built the system properly, then we should be able to serve you, whether you're a very small small business or you're a medium or a larger small business. Um, and we should also be able to serve you regardless of the industry that you operate in, as long as it's legal. Um, you know, that's really our only restriction, if you will. Um, so that's, that's really who we serve. And, um, and one of the great things I remember um, from when we first started the, businesses, started the business was I spent a lot of time uh, at an annual at annual Amazon shows for sellers, you would, uh, and I did. Yeah, I did. We we spent a huge amount of time. We had a table, and I we got to know. In fact, became friends with lots of folks who are, who are Amazon sellers. Same for eBay. We attended all the eBay on location events around the country. Uh, and when I say we attended, it was really Mark Catherine and I went there, and we would throw these phenomenal parties. Um, so. I think you know. I think one thing that was really resonated with us um, early on um, was the fact that nobody was treating their business like a real business. And we would go in and we'd be like, "Hey, can we buy you a beer, or can we get you a soda, or can we get you something, and talk to you about your business?" And literally, the small business owners would be like, "You're talking to me, right? I mean, this is that's so kind of you." And we're like, "What are you talking about? You're doing a great thing. You should be." treated with the kind of respect um, that any business gets. They weren't used and to like a red carpet treatment. N nothing. And, and I mean, it was, just, it was just shocking to us. And I think it was one of the things early on. It's great to start a business and to try to get it out there. Uh, and I have to say that until I went to those shows, I didn't realize it's not just about the fact that small businesses were not getting capital. It's the, back, the fact that small business, weren't, they weren't even getting respect in the market. Hmm. And, um, and, and that's a real problem because small businesses are responsible for two thirds of all the new jobs that are out there and responsible for more, more than half of the total revenue generated in the country every year outside of farming. And, and it's ridiculous that, um, you know, that they were treated like the, you know, the, you know, ugly stepchild of the financial industry for so long. So Rob, how do you figure out who to give money to? I know you have a lot of probably complicated algorithm technology. Um, yeah, I mean, the way we figured it out was it, it really was trial and error. Um, one thing we recognized early on was that most small businesses, um, the, the decision whether to give them funds or not give them funds, were based on their personal credit. And we had a theory going at, on in the beginning that, that wasn't the best indicator because um, having had a small business prior to starting Cabbage, Cabbage was a small business for a long time. Um, one thing I realized is that personal credit really gets injured during the process, the process of starting and building a small business. And frankly, it gets hurt during the process of running it because you're going to have sort of cash flow changes 
and you're going to rely on personal credit to get you there. And, um, and so it, we figured it wasn't the best measure, but what we had to do was two things. One is give us access to a whole bunch of data and then also let us know how your you know, personal credit is so that we could create a baseline effectively. And then once you create a baseline, then you can move away or at least somewhat away from relying on any sort of personal credit information. And so the, the data that we use um, principally in underwriting is based on information that's not contained in a personal credit bureau, the small business owner, uh, because um, there are many, there, these other data sources are much better indicators of mm -hmm. a likelihood of repayment. So we, we build models. Um, and by the way, just to put this in perspective, yeah. I was not in this industry before I started Cabbage. <laughs> And so all of the knowledge, the, the entirety of the information yeah. that I have about credit and risk, I've learned on the job. Like I think one of the, owners. in the talk, you put up a, uh, a slide about the bad things in, uh, venture capitalists have said about you during the process. And one was, well, maybe it was about some, I think it was, it was, why is Rob CEO? He's a lawyer or something. Yeah. Like <laughs> exactly. And that's about the best thing they said that day. Um, <laughs> I remember that one very, very clearly. We, uh, Mark, Catherine, and I, and you get all these weird motivations to keep you going when you first start a business uh, because uh, you know it, you, that's pretty much the, the reward you get when you first start a business is just your fantasies of what happens when you succeed. <laughs> um, and so our, our thought on that, I remember the specific person. What we wanted to do was um, once the company succeeded was buy the building where his office was located <laughs> and over the weekend, paint the entire thing green with the cabbage logo oh, so that he would come in and that's all he can, uh, you know, like literally hallways, everything just said cabbage everywhere and was green. Um, just either that or buy the property surrounding his house and put up a cabbage. I love where your mind goes. The, plant. the yeah, fantasies you know. of this. <laughs> <laughs> Add in, you, and and uh, and taking blood from comatose patients, and, and then you start wondering, like, why I'm even running this company. <laughs> um, so, anyways, I interrupted you. <laughs> how you figure out? So, how you figure out how to who to give money to? And you were saying that you learned everything, obviously, on the on the job um, or you know doing this. And before we started, you talked about one thing about social importance. That you pull in what what's the important like how do you pull in the social aspects that that gives you any type of data that will lead if you should give this person money or not yeah and so when it's not your personal facebook account or your personal twitter account mm -hmm. you know all small many small businesses or most small businesses as as your um audience probably realizes um utilize twitter and facebook and other social um media channels to um, keep in touch with their customers to talk about their business um, to promote new products, services they're offering, to respond to um, complaints or comments that folks may have, and mm, I gotcha. um, yeah. and that's, that's a risk factor. It's what's well, risk. Like yeah. it, the the theory was again when we went out there is if you're keeping in touch with your customers and you're active in doing that, you're probably running a biz better business than somebody who does not give us access to that data. Yeah. That's not to say that they're not. It's just to give us that. And so that was the theory, and it's actually proved out. We actually launched that, uh, that um, concept in September of 2011. We called it social climbing, hmm. um, which was one of the naming conventions I was hmm. very proud of. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Even junior high people would know what that means. There you go. Yeah. The, um, what are some other big risk factors that you look at? Um, so, you know, what you're looking, you know, what we're looking at principally, we're looking at three things, but we ask them in different ways. So we're trying to understand the capacity of your small business. And that's really for understanding sort of the inflows and the outflows, the profitability, the best picture we can paint of the profitability of the business, um, and then how robust it is. So that's capacity. Uh, and you can determine that a bunch of different ways through a bunch of different channels. Certainly, if you're tapping into Amazon, you know how robust the sales are or not robust they are and how they varied over time. Uh, and I'll talk about variation over time in a second. This, the second piece is what I'd call the character. Um, and what that means is um, you know, if we give you a loan and you can't afford to make the repayment, will you actually make it? You know, And so that's a little bit of a that's litmus test. Yeah, that's and, and by the way, it's something you've got to assess. Uh, and then the third piece is what you would call consistency or stability. The old way that folks did that was they 
said, okay, a business that's been in business for nine years is more likely to be around the 10th year than a business that's been around for a month is going to be around for two months. Right. Um, and, and certainly longevity of business is one way to look at it. But you can also look at customer concentrations. You, you can look for other factors of stability um, that might indicate you know, how long you've been in the same location. Um, you, know, you, can, you can try to figure out you know, what's been the trend of employee, you know, employee growth over time. You know, and by the way, lots of our small business um, customers don't have any employees or only have one employee. So that might not be a relevant factor. And they might be the most stable business in the world because they have, you know, this, this same, you know, 100 customers have been buying from them for the last 10 years. And so, you know, those customers are going to be around for another 10 years. And, you know, guess what? Customers don't die off quickly. You don't see churn in their customer portfolio mm -hmm. through who, to whom they're shopping, shipping or something along those lines. So there's lots. So we these are actually the same questions that banks ask small business owners and they try to get information on. We just happen to get that information from you sources, data, the data sources. that yeah. basically tells the story. Tells the story, and by the way, it tells it on an ongoing basis. So we stay connected to that data. So we understand whether the stability of the business has changed. We understand whether the character of the small business owner has changed. We understand if the capacity of that business has changed over time, which is an important dimension that's not typically taken into account um, by you know traditional financial institutions. Yeah, Rob, a big question I have. So so someone gets the money. And yep. then obviously they're going to use it for something. I'm curious because you see a lot of you know different uh, stories. Probably, what's the biggest mistakes people make after receiving the funds? Um, well, I think I think first of all, there, there's a lot more mistakes on um, deciding to take funds in the first place. Right? You mean so, they're approved and they don't take them? Well, no, no. I mean, no. The, the, so are you saying what are the biggest mistakes that we make when we've provided funds or the biggest mistakes that customers, yeah, the uh, customers make when they receive it? Exactly, so the yeah. The first thing is, and it, and it happens either before or after, is they don't really think um, of how to use the money properly. You know, so you know, we are yeah. always big fans of folks that use money for revenue-generating activities. If you want to go buy a tractor for your farm or you want to go buy a conference room table for your office – or something along those lines, we're probably not the best source of capital for you. Um, we, you know, we, 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 it's important that customers are focused on taking our funds and using them as growth oriented funds, right? Something that's going to help their business grow, something that's either going to generate uh, an immediate return or a significant return over a reasonable period of time. Um, and I actually think that's a better way because a lot of people, you know, you don't need, and I've never been one. Uh, you don't need marble in your office. You don't need a mahogany desk. You don't need, you know, the fanciest, latest, greatest monitors, you know, in your office or whatever it may be. You've got to always approach your business. And I, trust me, I'm, I'm like, I, I, in 2001, I basically quit, you know, didn't quit my job. I kind of got, I, I kind of got, I didn't really get fired, but I kind of got laid off in the connection with the dot com bust. Like my company basically went out of business, not my company, but the company I was working for. Right. So I was really gone, right? So, and I made a decision then that I was going to yeah, work for myself and mm. uh, build a business. And, you know, that scrappiness is something you always have to have as a small business owner and you can't ever lose it. You can't lose sight uh, of the way you started the business. And I think um, the biggest mistakes that people make is they talk themselves into thinking they need something that they really don't need. They're making need. purchases that are not revenue generating activities and they can probably do a scrappier version of. Yeah, do always, always be scrappy. I mean, to me, that is a very, very important um, way to think about stuff. I still do it now, even though we're a much larger company now. Um, that attitude I love. I mean, we all are at desk. We don't have fancy offices. We don't do anything along those lines. Um, we, I believe in scrappiness in the business. And, uh, and you know, you have a responsibility yourself. You have a responsibility to your family. Um, you have a responsibility to whoever lends you money. You know, you have a responsibility to your other employees. You know, you just have it to be really conscious about that stuff. And I'm sure with the individual people who get money from, from Cabbage, there's very, everyone has varying interest rates, right? Based off of their, you know, whatever their history is. How do you figure out what the, the interest rate is for, for individuals or for the companies? Sure. No, absolutely. I mean, it, it goes back to the questions uh, that we ask, which I mentioned a moment 
like between capacity, character, and, and consistency or stability. Um, so we make judgments based on those factors, and um, customers fall into different bands, and those bands are sort of pricing tiers, if you will. And it what it does is it it predicts the likelihood, it predicts sort of the borrowing capacity, but also predicts the likelihood of of non-payment and or non-performance and what we try to do with our customers over time is we try to um, monitor their performance and by monitoring that they can actually migrate up and end up getting um, you know they have the opportunity to get lower fees or larger and or larger lines uh, and ultimately that's the path that you wanna yeah. that you wanna go on yeah are those is that like what's the most commonly ask questions to you is it what's the interest rate going to what are the most common they ask questions from businesses asking cabbage how it works usually it's uh can i you know i need more money can i have money i need more money um, can I have yeah money? i mean it's right. it's and look it's natural right you want yeah. you want to put your business in the best position it can be so having access to capital can do that but what we don't do which a lot of other folks do is they ask them how much do you need or how much do you want and then they take them through an underwriting process, and then they either mm-hmm. tell them, "Yes, I can do that," or "Here's, you know, I can do more than that," or "I can do less than that." We actually let the data uh, speak for itself, and we come back and we say, "Hey, Jeremy, your business qualified for twenty-five thousand dollars. Congratulations!" Now you might have it in your mind that you needed ten or you needed fifty, but you've qualified for twenty-five, and if you mm-hmm. only need ten, that's all you have to take. What we don't want to do is put ourselves in a, in a conflicted with position with a customer, which is you ask for 50, we have to come back with the disappointing news that it's only going to be 25. Uh, and we've done this based on our um, calculation of the, of the right amount of risk in the, in the relationship. And so it's actually be beneficial to the small business to listen to sort of what our uh, models say because it sizes it accordingly and based on what we see businesses of that size can affordably repay, repay and the amount of money they should be receiving at a particular you know juncture in their lives uh, and that's based off of you know many many now many hundreds of thousands uh, of loans that we've made yeah Rob. i mean a company like yours like cabbage takes on a huge amount of risk because you're obviously lending money to different companies uh, obviously, you minimize your risk with all the algorithms, but I mean, there's always going to be a default rate of people who doesn't you know, don't pay back. I'm really curious about if you can think of any businesses you thought this is a slam dunk. This is like absolutely this company is going to thrive. They're going to pay back in probably shorter period of time than what they say, and what ended up they didn't. So and I know all, you can't mention all, names all, all, and everything. All the customers, but... all the customers who have ever defaulted fall into that category. Um, look, <laughs> really? you know, you, well, I mean, you know, at a certain point, you always expect that a certain number are not going to be able to uh, repay, right. um, or not going to repay, even if they can't afford to repay. Yeah. Um, so there's always going to be that factor, but you don't go into it. Um, you know, you you go into it with the expectation, you know, you, you sort of have to believe that there's positive intent in the world, you know, that folks are going to do well, are going to, yeah. and are going to, are going to be good uh, yeah. people. And so we, we sort of take that. Um, yeah. I mean, look, there were businesses early on that we took risks on. I remember we made, when we were only a company that the highest lines we were providing were twenty or $40,000. We went to a few businesses, a couple of them here locally, and gave them a hundred thousand uh, dollars. And uh, well, I think uh, I'm sorry. There was like there was two of those businesses. One was here, and one was actually out in California, uh, and both ultimately defaulted. And um, and so yeah, I would say that um, I would say that yeah, we were surprised. And you know what? We we didn't really. Why did let- they default? I mean, like. It comes to the question like why small businesses fail, right? You hear these crazy stats like nine out of ten small businesses fail. You probably have your finger on the pulse of that better than anyone. So I'm curious, what are some of the reasons why they failed? Um, well, look, I, you, you know, I'm sitting in my seat. I don't ever know for sure. Um, mm-hmm. I know the people that we lent to in those two situations were actually really good people because we knew them and yeah. we took the risk with them. Um, we personally knew them. Right. Um, and so, you know, one person got way ahead of their skis and they and they tried to grow too fast. Mm-hmm. Um, that was uh, one that was um, pretty evident. Um, and so they they took on a lot of obligations that they shouldn't right. have taken on. And, and, yeah. and by the way, you know, I mean, I, I don't think our 
Cat was responsible for that. But it, it harkens back to what I said a moment ago, which is you have to borrow money for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons. Right. Because it, you, you can't treat a loan like revenue um, or like profit. You got to treat a loan like well, it's, like accumu- it's accumulating interest every day. So Exactly. And, yeah. and a lot of people treat it like income. And you can't treat it really? like income. Like they'll, they'll well, just... there's, there's, there, I mean, you know, the, all of a sudden you got $50,000 in your account that you didn't have yesterday. What am I going to do with 50000 Well, you know what? That chair is so ugly. <laughs> and I've been dying to get a new chair. I'm going to go get a new chair. I got Like you. I have the money. It's only 500 bucks, 400 bucks, whatever it is. I'm going to get a really nice chair. So you go and get the chair. It doesn't, your chair doesn't make a difference. Actually, I tend to think a chair does make a difference. That's probably a bad example because my back always kills me. But so a chair (laughs) makes a difference. But the aesthetics of a chair don't make a difference. Right. Um, You know, the comfort. You can get a $50 cushion to be on the chair. You you can get a pillow or get those beads um, that you put on the back of of the chair. So I I think, you know, one thing is, um, again, getting, sort of getting, so I think there's this concept of why businesses fail. Um, It's pretty simple. and by the way, I'm somebody who's had businesses who failed. Um, so I, I speak from, uh, from, a, from a position of, of knowledge. Uh, you know, you don't get to real revenue uh, either quickly enough or significantly enough. You, you know, somehow, you know, you've got to figure out how to monetize a business and how to turn it into revenue. The customer you know, flow is, is lacking. Yeah, and they, or the product market fit, right? So you're not, you haven't quite hit the market the right way or you're so – focused on the ideals or principles of your business you you know and you don't listen to the signs that nobody wants that nobody cares right you know and so you've got to make that and then you've got to be unbelievably unbelievably disciplined about expenses and got to really know how to categorize your expenses track them over time and also manage to them so you have you, so you can build some trend lines and you know you're moving in the right direction that's when you know you can buy the new chair Right. Yeah. So when you get to a certain point where you go, OK, I've hit this milestone, you know, we've we've you know, we're actually ahead of ourselves from a metrics perspective. And I'll, I'll put it in cabbage example uh, if you'll indulge me for. a Yeah, moment. go ahead. We have four expenses in our business. That's it. Four categories of expense. We have the cost to acquire customers and and have them utilize the product. So that's one big expense. We have the cost of bad debt. People not paying us back. You brought that up already. Yeah. We have our own cost of capital which is how much we have to pay to borrow money. And then we have the other cost of what I call other OPEX, and that means non-sales and marketing, overhead people, tables, yeah. chairs, utility bills. 350 things. people across. All yeah, people. Yeah. So those are the four expenses. And I look at those expenses as percentages. of And you can make it, if you're a small business owner, they're a percentage of something. They're a percentage of your revenue. Yeah. They're a percentage of your orders. They're a percentage of something that's meaningful in your business. And once you understand the categories of expense and you track them as a percentage of something, then you can manage to them. And so, you know, we can see how our cost to acquire customers either goes up or down over time. We can see how our OPEX goes up or, or down over time. We can see how our not, you know, how our, our non-performing loans or our bad debt, how that behaves over time. And yeah. we can manage to those things. And that's what you really need to do. Mm. Uh, and And businesses fail because they don't, understand the the top line and the bottom line and they don't they don't draw the parameters yeah. um, as to what success is that's a very scientific and a very numbers based concept um, and you know and I think people you know I'm, I'm like back and forth because I was always a guy um, I've always been an entrepreneur I was the kind of kid at eight or nine I carried around a you know a, a you know, notebook and I wrote down ideas uh, that I that I ever came up and I still have that book and um, there's wow. many terrible ideas in there <laughs> and um you know, but I, you know, I, I, I think people, you know, sort of romanticize the concept of starting a business, but, you know, ultimately you've got to figure out how to, you know, if you really believe in it, you've got to make it into, you know, you got to turn it into something, you know, that where you can, you can really, from a metrics based perspective, analyze it. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that, that breakdown, you know, cause probably I would think a lot of people don't necessarily know the cost it takes to acquire a customer, um, in general. So the cost to acquire a customer, the debt, cost of capital and then overhead i mean i think yep. that applies to to any business really um yeah no I, you know and i and i i totally agree with you and it's so funny i watch shark tank a lot with my family and uh which i love that show um and laurie grenier is is our spokesperson so i i especially love it um She's but your spokesperson uh, 
Yeah, she is. Not my, my personal one. She's not going around saying Rob's great or anything. <laughs> she's the spokesperson for Gabbage. I didn't realize that, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. That's true. She's... Uh, She's done that. She's uh, if you if you're you know then we're, we're um, shameless advertisers on many 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 uh, radio shows and so she's uh, uh, her commercials run quite That's often. That's great. Yeah. Now she's been fantastic. But you know one thing I've I've always you know they always ask the question or often they ask the question is um, what's the cost to acquire? Uh, and always. How much is the cost yeah. to acquire? Right. And that's really, it is an absolutely fundamentally critical. And by the way, you need to differentiate in your mind what the cost to acquire is when you're first starting the business and what your cost to acquire is when the business is up and running. Because you're always initially going to get a handful of customers or even mo more than a handful of customers pretty easy, right? Because so like when we started Cabbage, um, we'd gone to all these shows, right? So we were able to get 100 customers or 150 You targeted customers. the eBay sellers and the Amazon sellers. Yeah, we did yeah. that, but that's not 10,000 customers, right? That's yeah. 100 or 200 customers. So the question is, the cost to acquire the first 100 or 200 is vastly different than the cost to acquire the 10,000th customer. So you've got to really, you know, and I, not everybody's business needs 10,000 customers, but, you know, it might be three customers versus 30, right? So you've got to figure out what that is. Uh, and, um, and realize what the, you know, it, there's this, this saying that somebody taught me some time ago, you've got to figure out whether, um, the juice is worth the squeeze. Uh, and so, you know, that's one thing we pay close attention to, right. you know, how hard is it to acquire customers and, you know, are you asking customers to do unnatural acts in working with you? Rob, how do you even decide to choose or even have a spokesperson? <laughs> Uh, well, and then you know, how do you choose her? Um, how do we choose her? All right. So, spokesperson was. I have a. I have a theory. Am I allowed to curse here? Uh, sure. Okay. So, um, I always say there's a thousand shitty ways to acquire a small business customer, and that doesn't mean the cus That means it's very hard to find the audience, the small business audience, because um, they're everywhere. I mean, they, it's not like all the small business owners, you know congregate in one place at one time every week it doesn't ha happen you know and they don't also talk to each other that often right so it's not like you know, very you know siloed. You, like yeah. one small business owner you know their only four friends also run small businesses no in fact it's probably their other four people work in some large corporation or something right, right. um so you know my so my theory is is and you're, you're gonna have to repeat your question because I got so, so on a tangent. No, Jeremy. I keep so going sorry. on a tangent. That's all right. I like I, that. Once, no, once um, my, it, I want to start a company you, called Tangents International <laughs> because of the way my brain works. It was um, how you choose a spokesperson, but how you uh, got oh. to Lori. Yeah. So, so you know, we so we we developed a pretty comprehensive marketing approach where we um, worked through lots of different channels online. We use some traditional channels like radio, I mentioned, and direct mail. We have a business development channel where we partner with organizations that have large numbers of small businesses and their customers. So we have all these different uh, channels. But um, And I saw a lot of people advertising. I actually saw my competition advertising on Shark Tank because we oh. watch Shark Tank. Right, right. And then I looked at that and I was like, that's not the best way to advertise. I didn't think those probably, and I didn't know for sure, but I didn't think those were probably very successful ads. Um, but I thought the personalities were. And yeah. So, Cause you thought so, it was, I think where you were going with it was, it wasn't like there's was a lot of crappy ways to get a customer and that was not targeting where the small, I mean, there's some small business maybe that watch it, but there's just a lot of regular people. So you're not specifically targeting small businesses. If you advertise on a shark tank type of thing. Y Absolutely. Yeah. And it was extremely expensive advertising. And so we thought it would be better to partner with somebody like Lori, um, who, you know, is, you know, sort of the epitome of, of a great success. You know, somebody who started a small business, grew it into a large enterprise, um, has an extremely distinctive voice, but also is somebody who has been generally regarded as sort of the, the friendly shark or the warm shark. Right. Uh, you know, people love her. So and she was on your, your top list, top of the list. Yeah, for, yeah. absolutely. She, she sort of had represented all the, all the factors that were uh, important to us. And she represented mm -hmm. all the qualities that, that were important to us. And so yeah. that's why that happened. And we tested it and it worked great. People loved it so much so that our co competitor on deck signed Barbara. Really? But we have, we have Lori. So, there's that. How hard is it to strike a deal with a shark? 
Like Lori? Um, you know, I have to give um, Victoria, who's our um, head of sales and marketing, really the credit. She's the one that made the contact. Uh, she's the one that um, put that together. Uh, it's it's actually pretty complicated. I would <laughs> and think by the so. way, Lori, Lori was uh, is um, extremely involved in the process, which I thought was great. I mean, I had many, many, many discussions with her and text conversations with her, going you know back and forth at times. Uh, but what was great about it was she was personally invested, and yeah. so um, it's her it, it's her name. It's her know. name, and so yeah. she cares who represents it, and she also cares that it's a success. And I think. The other thing is you need people who are, you know, because these things are not that scientific that you know exactly how you're going to work with the person, exactly when you're going to need them to do what. Yeah. And you've got to have people that, that can think a little flexibly. And, and she, fortunately, is one of those people. Yeah. Rob, thank you. That, that, was, that was great. Um, <laughs> I want to hear about a couple of success stories. Okay. Um, some of your favorite success stories from people obviously utilizing the capital and doing great things. Who are some that come to mind? If you can't name um, the company, just like the scenario. Yeah, well, I, I mean, um, there there's a great um, there's a great company that's based out of uh, um, out of the uh, near not far from Seattle. Um, that is a kind of a farm to table. Are you familiar with uh, like plated or um, yeah? I forget the other one, blue something or whatever. Yeah, Blue Apron, I think it's Blue called. Apron. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a couple of those companies. This is a company run by two women um, who were in different fields before they started, and the and the company's name is Acme, which makes me think of the Roadrunner, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. Right from, from from cartoons growing up. But um, they they actually took our one billionth dollar, um, so they mm. borrowed the, the billionth dollar that we put out, and so they won this award, and we had this opportunity. They we they came in for what was called a business makeover, uh, and what was really fascinating about that is I learned way more about business from them than they could have possibly learned from me when they came in. Because <laughs> the way they thought about their business was yeah. just fantastic. They, um, they used Cabbage to um, expand. They were yeah. having problems getting a bank loan. But what they had is they had created this system where they sourced local products and turn them into sort of local meals. Uh, and I'm sure they're continuing to do that right now. Mm -hmm. But they basically built a multi-million dollar business uh, and they did it in an interesting way. They didn't raise venture capital. They didn't try to expand nationally. They basically said, we've got to source product from local farms and local local companies. Uh, and so naturally, if you're going to do that, it's gonna you're you're gonna be more focused in the geography that you work. I think they have now like five or six locations, all concentrated in the upper Northwest. Um, and the other thing that was really fascinating is they identified some challenges with the other companies that we just mentioned, uh, including the amount of packaging that is delivered with that product. I mean, you know, forget fossil fuels; that will put an end to the environment before you know, fossil fuels will because the, like the sheer amount of styrofoam and plastic that's used is incredible. So they're also a very eco-friendly company mm -hmm. uh, and they deliver in these like wood crates and they have, they also build a delivery system, Uber-like delivery system where people in the local community come pick it up and deliver it to the folks mm. and a thing where then those people that's put cool. the boxes back outside and they bring them back um, to their, you know, to their, to their business. And yeah. They just built a great business, and they just had sob. They figured out how to m put the meals together in a way that it could be profitable. They just executed really well. So that's that's probably the. Can the we mention their about. name, or so we sure. give them credit and uh, yes. link to them? Absolutely. What's the what's yeah. the? Well, Acme, Acme. I think it's Acme Farms and Table, but I will get you the exact. Okay. Because I want to make I'll... sure whoever's listening to this, they link up in the uh, in the show notes. Uh, the actual domain for them. So that's great. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh I'm gonna I'm looking them up right now. Acme Farms and Kitchen dot com. Is that is that right? That sounds did you look that up? Yep. Acme and that, Farms in, and Kitchen. Is it in uh is it in uh Washington State? Uh let's see here. Um if my internet was not uh it looks like it is it's shop cook eat Acme Farms yeah, that's and it's Acme, a, it's Farms Acme Farms and Kitchen dot com. Yes. yes, that's, that's them. Cool. So, Phenomenal. do they use it to just expand? What do they need the money for? Um, um, I feel yeah, like I I'm talking like Shark Tank. Like, what do you need the no, money? But, uh, well, you know, I, you know, one thing they've got to do is they had to move into larger spaces. They had to buy, you know, better refrigeration. They had to 
um, source, you know, products that, you know, they could deliver, you know, the boxes and the crates and the other sort of, you know, l- you know, more tangible ingredients that were in there. Um, so they used it for a variety of purposes. And I think they used it for a period of time. I, I couldn't tell you right now whether they um, are utilizing the the funds on an ongoing basis, but um, they used it for what they needed it. Um, and, and that's, and that's really the key. The key is not the key is to, you know, if you're if you're a company that needs it for a point in time, that's great. Um, and it's very episodic for a specific reason. If it's uh, – I hear a little little like bouncing on the uh, – is, is our connection still with us? Yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay, good, yeah. good, good. So uh, so bottom line is they, they needed the funds for a variety of purposes. and But I don't know that they need it on a, on a permanent basis. And that's a great customer for us, somebody that – you know, again, knows specifically what they need it for, and it's to grow the business. They're yeah. very, uh, they're, they're an organization that really understands uh, the benefit of managing expenses. Yeah. Rob, thank you so much for sharing this. I think everyone should check out the correct spelling, cabbage.com with a K. Um, and, you know, is there any other place we should point people towards on your site or on the web? Yeah, I, I think I think the only other couple things that would be cool um, would be first of all check out our blog. It's all about small business, yeah. and it's not pumping cabbage and taking money and taking a loan. It's literally just business advice, which is really um, hugely um, helpful. Uh, and then the next piece is check out Cabbage Cares, all with K's. So cabbage with a K, Cabbage Cares. We're incredibly community minded. Um, we have multiple events every single month. Hmm. Uh, to participate, we really are big believers in getting like what? back. Like what? What are some of the events? So we've um, twice a year, every year since 2011, we've gone to a place called Camp Twin Lakes, which is a um, uh, a camp for kids that have terminal and chronic illnesses and other life challenges to do um, a lot of work there as a company. We spent mm-hmm. time um, with uh, for uh, animal shelters, uh, with um, you know uh, packaging uh, products for for the hungry. Um, we've spent time in, uh, cleaning up the Chattahoochee river. Um, so we're literally rafting down a local river here and picking up trash. Um, we've done, uh, events with Easter seals, uh, for kids that have, um, other challenges as well. Um, so there's been just a huge number, uh, for refugees. We've done events, we've done, you name it, we've done it. Uh, and we usually support, um, organizations that are important to our employees uh, or impo- important to our customers. And yeah. so we're, we're big fans of supporting both. So is that Cabbage Cares is K-A-R-E-S? You got it. Uh, okay. But you could, you could check it out. It should be on the either part of the about part of our page. But it's just to learn a little bit more about, you know, what's important to us because I think a lot, of, a lot of companies talk about community involvement and, and things along those mm-hmm. lines. We actually are uh, exceedingly proactive yeah. about it. Uh, and, we're, and we're big proponents of... Uh, participating in the community great everyone should check out cabbage.com with the k and cabbagecares.com both with k's oh, no, cabbage cares is just part of our cabbage.com site we oh it is yeah, okay. it's, good, it's a good point somebody might reserve it now so thanks for that <laughs> <laughs> oh so it's not cabbagecares.com it's just a part of cabbage.com it's just part of cabbage.com it's part but of the no company. one squat on that domain right now there you go uh, i don't know that you get much for it so <laughs> good luck thank you rob anything else um that we didn't nope. talk about I'm sure there's lots we didn't yeah. talk about, but we'll save it for the next yeah. time. Thank you, Rob. Greatly All right. appreciate Take it. Take care. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a great rest of the day. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.